From the Conference Center Theater in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by previous recordings of various choirs throughout the world. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 191st Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on this glorious Easter morning. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our love and our greetings to all who are participating by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission throughout the world. We acknowledge members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles who are seated on the rostrum this morning. The music for this session will be provided by various choirs, directors, and accompanists. All selections have been previously recorded by members of the church living in many areas of the world. The Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square opened this meeting with On This Day of Joy and Gladness. A choir of members of the church from Mexico will now favor us with Redeemer of Israel. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Terence M. Vinson, a native of Australia and member of the Presidency of the Seventy, after which a choir of children from Korea will sing, I Love to See the Temple.
Our beloved Father in heaven, we approach thee now, grateful for the opportunity we have to do so on this beautiful Easter morning. We're particularly mindful of the glorious resurrection of our beloved Saviour, Jesus Christ, and pray that thou bless us with our testimonies as vibrant and strong as those of Mary and those others to whom our Saviour appeared following his resurrection. We pray thy blessing to be upon us this day, Father, and upon those who will speak at this meeting, that they may be blessed and guided by thee, that thy spirit may carry their message to the hearts and minds of those who will listen and watch. We're so grateful for thy love, grateful for the gospel which is restored and which carries thy doctrine pure and simple to the world. We pray that thou bless us, that we may reach out with love to all of thy children, both those living and those who have passed beyond mortality, that we may more effectively and demonstrably show love to all of thy children, as thou hast taught. We pray that thou bless those who are participating in this meeting with concerns and questions, that they may receive of thy spirit our messages from the spoken word, and messages communicated to their thoughts and hearts through thy spirit. We pray thy blessing upon all who will speak, and we thank thee for this wonderful opportunity on this glorious Easter morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 On this beautiful Easter morning, President Nelson expressed a great desire to have speakers from throughout the world preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will begin by hearing from Elder Ulysses Soares of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who is a native of Brazil. He will be followed by Sister Reina Isabel Alberto second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency, who is a native of Nicaragua. Elders S. Mark Palmer of New Zealand and Edward Dubay of Zimbabwe will then address us. They are both serving in the Africa South Area Presidency, and their messages were recorded previously.
My dear brothers and sisters, on this radiant Easter morning, my heart rejoices upon remembering the most marvelous, the most majestic, the most immeasurable act that has occurred in all of human history, the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. The eminent words of the prophet Isaiah magnify the greatness and selfliness of the Savior's condescension and sacrifice in behalf of all the children of God. And I quote, Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed." End of quote. By voluntarily taking upon himself the sins of all mankind, being cruelly nailed to the cross, and victoriously conquering death on the third day, Jesus gave a more sacred significance to the Passover ordinance that had been bestowed upon Israel in ancient times. In fulfillment of prophecy, he offered his own body and precious blood as the great and last sacrifice, validating the traditional symbols used in the celebration of the Lord's Passover. In doing so, Christ experienced physical and spiritual suffering that is incomprehensible to the human mind. The Savior himself said, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer bo both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men." End of quote. Christ graciously fulfilled the will of the Father through His infinite and merciful sacrifice. He overcame the sting of physical and spiritual death introduced to the world through the fall, offering us the glorious possibility of eternal salvation. Jesus was the only being capable of realizing this eternal and perfect sacrifice for all of us. He was chosen and foreordained in the great grand grand council in the heaven, even before the world was formed. Furthermore, being born of a mortal mother, he inherited the physical death. But from God, as the only begotten Son of the Father, he inherited the power of lay down his own life and then to take it up again. Additionally, Christ lived a perfect life that was without blemish, and therefore was exempt from the demands of the divine justice. On one occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith thought, and I quote, salvation could not come to the world without the mediation of Jesus Christ. God prepared a sacrifice in the gift of his own son, who should be sent in due time to open a door through which men might enter into the Lord's presence, end of quote. While through his sacrifice the Savior unconditionally removed the effects of physical death, he did not eliminate our personal responsibility to repent for the sins we commit. Rather, he extended to us a loving invitation to be reconciled to our Eternal Father. Through Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice, we can experience a mighty change of mind and heart bringing a fresh attitude both toward God and toward life in general. When we sincerely repent of our sins and turn our hearts and will to God and His commandments, we can receive His forgiveness and feel the influence of His Holy Spirit in greater abundance. Mercifully, we avoid, we avoid having to experience the death of the suffering the Savior endured. The gift of repentance is an expression of God's kindness towards His children, and it is a demonstration of His incomparable power to help us overcome the sins we commit. 
It is also an evidence of the patience and long suffering our loving Father has for our mortal weakness and frailties. President Russell M. Nelson, our beloved prophet, referred to this gift as the key to happiness and peace of mind. My dear friends, I testify to you that as we genuinely repent of our sins, we allow the atoning sacrifice of Christ to become wholly effective in our life. We will become free from the bondage of sin, find joy in our earthly journey, and become eligible to receive eternal salvation, which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all who believe in Jesus Christ and come unto Him. In addition to the majestic gift of salvation, the Savior offers us relief and comfort as we face our afflictions, temptations, and weaknesses of mortal life, including the circumstances we have experienced recently in the current pandemic. I can assure you that Christ is ever aware of the adversities and experience immortality. He understands all of the bitterness, agony, and physical pain, as well as the emotional and spiritual challenges we face. The Savior's bowels are filled with mercy, and He is always ready to succor us. This is possible because He personally experienced and took upon Himself in the flesh the pain of our weakness and infirmities. With meekness and humility of heart, he descended below all things and accepted being despised, rejected, and humiliated by men, having been wounded for our transgressions and iniquities. He suffered the stinks for all, taking upon himself the sins of the world, thus becoming our ultimate spiritual caregiver. As we draw nearer to Him, surrendering ourselves spiritually to His care, we'll be able to take upon ourselves His yoke, which is easy, and His burden, which is light, thus finding that promised comfort and rest. Furthermore, we'll receive the strength we all need to overcome the hardships, weaknesses, and sorrows of life, which are exceedingly difficult to endure without His help and healing power. The Scriptures teach us to cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. And then may God grant us that our burdens may be light through the joy of His Son. Near the end of last year, I learned of the passing of our dear couple, Mario and Regina Emmerich, who were very faithful to the Lord and passed away four days apart from one another due to the complications from COVID-19. One of their sons, who is currently serving as a bishop in Brazil, related the following to me, and I quote, It was so difficult to see my parents depart from this world in that condition, but I could clearly feel the hand of the Lord in my life amidst that tragedy because I received the strength and peace that transcended my understanding. Through my faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement, I received divine help and strengthen and comfort my family members and all those who helped us during this trying experience. Even though the miracle that everyone hoped for did not occur, personally, I am a witness of many other miracles that we have that have occurred in my own life and in the lives of my family members. I felt an inexpl inexplicable peace that penetrated the depths of my heart, giving me hope and confidence in the love of the Savior for me and in the plan of happiness of God for His children. I learned that on the very most grief-filled days, the loving arms of the Savior are always extended when we seek Him with all our heart, power, mind, and strength." End of quote. My dear brothers and sisters, on this Easter Sunday, I bear my solemn witness that Jesus rose from the dead and that He lives. I testify to you that through Him and His infinite atonement, the Savior provided us the way to overcome death 
both physically and spiritually. In addition to these great blessings, He also offers us comfort and assurance in difficult times. I assure you that as we put our trust in Jesus Christ and His supernal atoning, atoning sacrifice, enduring in our faith to the end, we will enjoy the promises of our beloved Heavenly Father, who does everything within His power to help us return to His presence one day. This is His work and His glory. I testify to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Redeemer of the world, the promised Messiah, the resurrection and the life. And I share these truths with you in His holy name, the only begotten of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On this glorious Easter Sunday, our children joyfully sing, On a golden springtime, Jesus Christ awoke and left the tomb where he had lain. The bands of death he broke. We are grateful for our knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, at some point in our lives, we will have felt heartbroken after losing someone whom we love dearly. Through the current global pandemic, Many of us have lost loved ones, either family members or friends. We pray for those who are grieving such loss. President Russell M. Dawson has said, irrespective of age, we mourn for those loved and lost. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. Moreover, we can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without tearful separations now. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of life. We can imagine how Jesus' friends who had followed him and ministered to him felt upon witnessing his death. We know that they mourned and wept. On the day of the crucifixion, not knowing what would happen on Sunday, they must have been overwhelmed by distress, wondering how they will go on without their Lord. Nevertheless, they continued ministering to him even in death. Joseph of Arimathea begged Pilate to give him Jesus' body. He took the body down, wrapped it in fine linen, laid it in his own new tomb, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre. Nicodemus brought myrrh and aloes. He helped Joseph take the body and wrapped it in linen with the spices. Mary Magdalene and other women followed Joseph and Nicodemus, watched where they laid Jesus' body, and prepared sweet spices and ointments to anoint it. According to the strict laws of that day, they waited to further prepare and anoint the body because Saturday was the Sabbath. Then, early in the morning on Sunday, they went to the sepulcher. After realizing that the body of the Savior was not there, they went to tell the disciples who were Jesus' apostles. The apostles came with them to the tomb and saw that it was empty. All but Mary Magdalene eventually left, wondering what had happened to the Savior's body. Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb by herself. Only a few days before, she had seen the tragic death of her friend and master. Now his tomb was empty, and she did not know where he was. It was too much for her to take in, and she wept. At that moment, the resurrected Savior came to her and asked why she was weeping and whom she was seeking. Thinking that the gardener spoke to her, she asked that if he had taken her Lord's body to tell her where it was so she could get it. 
I imagine that the Lord may have allowed Mary Magdalene to grieve and to express her pain. He then called her by her name, and she turned to him and recognized him. She saw the resurrected Christ and was a witness of his glorious resurrection. Like you, in some way I can relate to the anguish felt by Mary Magdalene and her friends as they grieved the death of their Lord. When I was nine years old, I lost my older brother during a devastating earthquake. Because it happened unexpectedly, it took me a while to grasp the reality of what had occurred. I was heartbroken by sorrow, and I will ask myself, what happened to my brother? Where is he? Where did he go? Will I ever see him again? But then, I did not yet know about God's plan of salvation, and I had the desire to know where we come from, what the purpose of life is, and what happens to us after we die. Don't we all have those yearnings when we lose a loved one or when we go through difficulties in our lives? A few years after, I started thinking of my brother in a specific way. I would imagine him knocking on our door. I will open the door, he will be standing there, and he will tell me, I am not dead, I am alive. I could not come to you, but now I will stay with you and never leave again. That imagining, almost a dream, helped me cope with the pain that I felt over losing him. The thought that he will be with me came to me, to my mind, over and over. Sometimes I will even stare at the door, hoping that he will knock and I will see him again. About 40 years later, during Easter time, I was pondering about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I started thinking about my brother. At that moment, something clicked in my mind. I remembered imagining him coming to see me. That day, I realized that the Spirit had given me comfort in a difficult time. I had received a witness that my brother's spirit is not dead. He is alive. He is still progressing in his eternal existence. I now know that my brother shall rise again at that magnificent moment when, because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, we will all be resurrected. In addition, he has made it possible for all of us to be reunited as families and have eternal joy in the presence of God if we will choose to make and keep sacred covenants with him. President Nelson has taught, death is a necessary component of our eternal existence. No one knows when it will come, but it is essential to God's great plan of happiness. Thanks to the atonement of the Lord, eventual resurrection is a reality, and eternal life is a possibility for all humankind. For sorrowing loved ones left behind, the sting of death is soothed by a steadfast faith in Christ, a perfect brightness of hope, a love of God and of all men, and a deep desire to serve them. That faith, that hope, that love will qualify us to come into God's holy presence with our eternal companions and families, dwell with him forever. I testify that if Christ had not risen from the dead or had broken the bands of death, that the grave should have no victory and that death should have no sting, there could have been no resurrection. But there is a resurrection, therefore the grave had no victory, and the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened, yea, and also a life which is endless, that there can be no more death. Jesus Christ himself declared, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
I testify that through the redeeming atonement and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, broken hearts can be healed, anguish can become peace, and distress can become hope. He can embrace us in his arms of mercy, comforting, empowering, and healing each of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Several years ago, while attending meetings in Salt Lake City, I was greeted by our dear prophet, Russell M. Nelson. In his typically warm and personal way, he asked, Mark, how is your mum doing? I told him I had been with her earlier that week at her home in New Zealand, that she was getting old, but was full of faith and an inspiration to all who knew her. He then said, please give her my love and tell her I look forward to seeing her again. I was rather surprised and asked, do you have a trip planned to New Zealand soon? With thoughtful sincerity, he replied, oh, no, I will see her in the next life. There was nothing frivolous in his response. It was a perfectly natural expression of fact. In that private, unguarded moment, I heard and felt pure testimony from a living prophet that life continues after death. This conference weekend, you will hear living apostles and prophets testify of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day. All other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to this truth. I promise that as you listen with real intent, the Spirit will confirm in your mind and your heart the truth of these testimonies. Jesus' ancient apostles were forever changed after he appeared to them following his death. Ten of them saw for themselves that he had been resurrected. Thomas, being initially absent, declared, Except I shall see, I will not believe. Later, Jesus admonished Thomas, saying, Be not faithless, but believing. Then the Lord taught the vital role of faith. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The resurrected Lord gave his apostles the charge to testify of him. As with our living apostles today, they left behind worldly occupations and spent the rest of their lives boldly declaring that God had raised up this Jesus. Their powerful testimonies led to thousands accepting the invitation to be baptized. The glorious message of Easter morning is central to all Christianity. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and because of this, we too will live again after we die. This knowledge gives meaning and purpose to our lives. If we go forward in faith, we will be forever changed as were the apostles of old. We, like them, will be able to endure any hardship with faith in Jesus Christ. This faith also gives us hope for a time when our sorrow shall be turned into joy. My own faith had its beginnings following a time of sorrow. My father and mother were sheep farmers in New Zealand. They enjoyed their life. As a young married couple, they were blessed with three little girls. The youngest of these was named Anne. One day, while they were on holiday together at a lake, 17-month-old Anne toddled off. After minutes of desperate searching, she was found lifeless in the water. This nightmare caused unspeakable sorrow. Dad wrote years later that some of the laughter went out of their lives forever. It also caused a yearning for answers to life's most important questions. What will become of our precious Anne? Will we ever see her again? How can our family ever be happy again? Some years after this tragedy, 
two young missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints came to our farm. They began teaching the truths found in the Book of Mormon and the Bible. These truths include the assurance that Anne now lives in the spirit world. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, she too will be resurrected. They taught that the Church of Jesus Christ has once again been restored on earth with a living prophet and 12 apostles. And they taught the unique and remarkable doctrine that families can be bound together forever by the same priesthood authority Jesus Christ gave his chief apostle Peter. Mum instantly recognized truth and received a witness of the Spirit. Dad, however, wrestled for the next year between doubts and spiritual nudges. Also, he was reluctant to change his way of life. One morning following a sleepless night while pacing the floor, he turned to mum and said, I will be baptized today or never. Mum told the missionaries what had happened. They immediately recognized the flicker of faith in my father that would now be either lit or extinguished. That very morning, our family traveled to the nearest beach. Unaware of what was happening, we children had a picnic on the sand dunes, while elders Boyd Green and Gary Sheffield led my parents into the ocean and baptized them. In a further act of faith, Dad privately committed to the Lord that, come what may, he would be true all his life to the promises he was making. One year later, a temple was dedicated in Hamilton, New Zealand. Shortly thereafter, our family, with someone representing Anne, knelt around the altar in that sacred house of the Lord. There, by the authority of the priesthood, we were united as an eternal family in a simple and beautiful ordinance. This brought great peace and joy. Many years later, Dad told me that if not for Anne's tragic death, he would never have been humble enough to accept the restored gospel. Yet the Spirit of the Lord instilled hope that what the missionaries taught was true. This led to my parents' faith growing until they each burned with the fire of testimony that quietly and humbly guided their every decision in life. I will always be thankful for my parents' example to future generations. It's impossible to measure the number of lives forever changed because of their acts of faith in response to profound sorrow. I invite all who feel sorrow, all who wrestle with doubt, all who wonder what happens after we die, to place your faith in Christ. I promise that if you desire to believe, then act in faith and follow the whisperings of the Spirit. You will find joy in this life and in the world to come. How I look forward to the day I will meet my sister Anne. I look forward to a joyful reunion with my father, who died over 30 years ago. I testify of the joy to be found in living by faith, believing without seeing, but knowing by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ lives. With all my heart and soul, I choose to follow Jesus Christ and his restored gospel. This blesses every aspect of my life. I know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, our Savior and our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As I read the book of Acts and Paul's epistles, I'm amazed on how Paul was driven by love and gratitude in saving, teaching, and testifying of Jesus Christ. How can such a person save with such love and gratitude, especially considering his great sufferings? What motivated Paul to save? Quote, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Close quote. To press toward the mark is to faithfully continue on the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life with our Savior and our Father in heaven. 
Paul reviewed his sufferings as not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul's letter to the Philippians, which he wrote when he was bound in prison, is a letter of overwhelming joy and rejoicing and encouragement to all of us, particularly in this difficult time of uncertainty. We all need to take courage from Paul. I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. While we look at Paul's service, we are inspired and uplifted by our own Pauls in our day who serve, teach, and testify with love and gratitude amidst the challenges they face in their lives and in the lives of their loved ones. An experience I had nine years ago it helped me to realize the importance of pressing toward the mark. In 2012, as I walked for the first time in the general conference leadership meeting, I could not help feeling overwhelmed and inadequate. In my mind, there was a voice persistently repeating, you do not belong here. A serious mistake had been made. Just as I was walking, trying to find a place to sit, Elder Jeffrey Ara Holland spotted me. He came to me and said, Edward, it is good to see you here and he tenderly patted my face. I felt like a baby. His love and embrace warmed me up and he helped me to feel the spirit of belonging, the spirit of brotherhood. On the following day, I observed Elder Holland doing the same thing he had done to me on the previous day, warmly patting Elder Dallin H. Oak's face, who is his senior. At that moment, I felt the Lord's love through this man, we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. Elder Holland, through his kind, natural actions, he helped me to overcome my self-centeredness and my feelings of inadequacy. He helped me to focus on the sacred and joyful work to which I had been called to bring souls to Christ. He, like Paul of old, pointed me to press toward the mark Interestingly, Paul is exhorting us to press forward while calling us to forget that which is behind, our past fears, our past focus, our past failures, and our past sadness. He is inviting us, just like our dear prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, to a newer, holier approach. The Savior's promise is real. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. In my first general conference address, I shared an experience of my mother teaching me to work in our field. Never look back, she said. Look ahead at what we still have to do. Towards the end of her life, while mother battled cancer, she lived with Naomi and me. One night, I had her sobbing in her bedroom. Her pain was intense, even after taking her last daily dose of morphine only two hours earlier. I entered her room and sobbed with her. I prayed aloud for her to receive instant relief from her pain. And then she did the same thing she had done in the field years ago. She stopped and taught me a lesson. I'll never forget your face at that moment, frail, stricken, and full of pain, gazing with pity on your sorrowing son. She smiled through her tears, looked directly into my eyes and said, it is not up to you or anyone else, but it is up to God whether this pain will go away or not. I sat up quietly. She said, she too sat quietly. The sin remains in my mind, vivid in my mind. That night, through my mother, the Lord taught me a lesson that will stay with me forever. As my mother expressed the acceptance of God's will, I remember the reason Jesus Christ suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross at Golgotha. He said, Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is my gospel which I have given unto you that I came into the world to do the will of my father because my father sent me. 
As I reflect on our dear prophet, President Nelson's prophetic questions to us on the last general conference, President Nelson asked, are you willing to let God prevail in your life? Are you willing to let God be the most important influence in your life? Will you allow his voice to take precedence over every other ambition? Are you willing to have your will be swallowed up in his? My mother would have responded with an emotional but firm yes. And other faithful members of the church across the globe would also respond with an emotional but firm yes. President Nelson, thank you for inspiring and uplifting us with these prophetic questions. Recently, I had a conversation in Pretoria, South Africa, with a bishop who buried his wife and his adult daughter on the same day. Their lives were claimed by this coronavirus pandemic. I asked how he was doing. Bishop Ted Tabetes' response strengthened my resolve to follow the words and counsel from the Lord's prophets, seers, and revelators. Bishop Tabete responded that there is always hope and comfort in knowing that the Savior has taken upon himself the pains of his people, that he may know how to suck us. With deep faith, he testified, I'm grateful for the plan of salvation, the plan of happiness. He then asked me a question. Is this not, is this not what our prophet was trying to teach us this last conference? While the challenges of mortality will come to all of us in one way or another, let us focus on the goal of our pressing toward the mark, which is the prize of the high calling of God. My humble invitation to all of us is to never give up. We are called to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It is not so much about what we are going through in life, but what we are becoming. There is joy in pressing toward the mark. I testify that you who overcame all who help us as we look up to him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you brethren, for your great messages. A choir of women and children from around the world will now favor us with the beloved primary hymn, I Am a Child of God. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Jose A. Teixeira, a native of Portugal and a member of the Presidency of the Seventy. He will be followed by Elder Taniela B. Wakolo, a native of Fiji, who is serving as president of the Philippines area. His message was recorded previously. He will be followed by Elders Chi Hong Sam Wong, a native of Hong Kong, and Michael John Yu Tay, a native of the Philippines. This is the Sunday morning session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
In 1946, the young researcher Arthur Hassler was hiking along a mountain stream near his boyhood home when he had an experience that led to an important discovery about how fish find their way back to their birth streams. Hiking up a mountain, yet out of sight of his favorite childhood waterfall, Astler was suddenly brought back to a forgotten memory. He said, as a cool breeze bearing the fragrance of mosses and columbine swept around the rocky abutment, the details of this waterfall and its setting on the face of the mountain suddenly leapt into my mind's eye. These smells rekindled his childhood memories and reminded him of home. If smells could trigger such memories for him, he reasoned that perhaps smells could be as evocative to salmon, who after years of being in the open ocean, returned to the exact stream of their birth to spawn. Based on this experience, Astler, together with other researchers, went on to demonstrate that salmon remember the very sense that would help them navigate thousands of miles to find their way back from the sea. This account caused me to think that one of the most important things we can do in this life is to recognize and remember the pathway back to our Heavenly Father and faithfully and joyfully persevere throughout the journey. I thought of four reminders that when used and applied consistently in our lives can rekindle feelings of our heavenly home. First, we can remember that we are children of God. We have a divine heritage, knowing that we are children of God and that He wants us to return to His presence is one of the first steps on the journey back to our heavenly home. Remind yourself of this heritage. Make time regularly to boost your spiritual immune system by remembering the blessings you have received from the Lord. Trust the guides you have been given from Him rather than turning solely to the world to measure your personal worth and find your way. Recently, I visited a loved one after she had been in the hospital. She told me with emotion that while she was lying in the hospital bed, all she desired was for someone to sing to her the song, I am a child of God. That thought alone, she said, gave her the peace she needed in that hour of affliction. Knowing who you are changes what you feel and what you do. Understanding who you truly are better prepares you to recognize and remember your way back to your heavenly home and yearn to be there. Second, we can remember the foundation that protects us. Strength comes to us when we remain righteous, true, and faithful to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, even when others overwhelmingly disregard the commandments and principles of salvation. In the Book of Mormon, Elaman taught his sons to remember that they must build their foundations on Jesus Christ in order to have the strength to withstand the temptations of the adversary. Satan's mighty winds and storms are beating upon us, but they will have no power to drag us down if we put our trust in the safest place, in our Redeemer. I know from personal experience that as we choose to hear His voice and follow Him, we will receive His help. We will obtain a wider perspective of our circumstances and a deeper understanding of the purpose of life. We will feel the spiritual stirrings that will guide us to heavenly home. Third, we can remember to be prayerful. We live in a time when, with a single touch or a voice command, we can begin searching for answers on almost any topic in the immensity of data stored and organized in a vast and complex network of computers. On the other hand, we have the simplicity of the invitation to begin seeking answers from heaven. Pray always, and I will pour out my Spirit upon you. Then the Lord promises, and great shall be your blessing, yea, even more than if you should obtain treasures of earth. God is fully aware of each one 
of us and ready to listen to our prayers. When we remember to pray, we find His sustaining love. And the more we pray to our Father in heaven in Christ's name, the more we bring the Savior into our life, and the better we will recognize the path He has marked to our heavenly home. Fourth, we can remember to serve others. As we strive to follow Jesus Christ by serving and showing kindness to others, we make the world a better place. Our actions can significantly bless the lives of those around us and our, li our own lives as well. Loving service adds meaning to the lives of both the giver and the receiver. Do not underestimate the potential you have to influence others for good, both by the service of your actions and by the service of your example. Loving service to others guides us along the path to our heavenly home, the path of becoming like our Savior. In 1975, as a result of a civil war, Arnaldo and Eugenia Teles Grillo and their children had to leave behind their home and all that they had built through decades of hard work. Back in their native country of Portugal, brother and sister Teles Grillo faced the challenge of starting all over again. But years later, after joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they said, We lost everything we had, but it was a good thing because it compelled us to consider the importance of eternal blessings. They lost their earthly home, but they found the way back to their heavenly home. Whatever you must leave behind to follow the path to heavenly home, will one day seem like no sacrifice at all. We have Jesus Christ's perfect example to follow, and the journey towards our eternal home is possible only because of His teachings, His life, and His atoning sacrifice, including His death and glorious resurrection. I invite you to experience the joy of remembering that we are children of God, that He so loved the world that He has sent His Son to show us the path, I invite you to remember to be faithful, to turn your life to the Savior and build your foundation on Him. Remember to be prayerful in your journey and serve others along the way. Dear brothers and sisters, on this Easter Sunday, I bear testimony that Jesus Christ is the Redeemer and Savior of the world. He is the one that can usher us to the table of a joyful life and guide us in our journey. May we remember and follow Him home. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, I rejoice within the gospel of Jesus Christ. I bring with me love from the resilient members in the Philippines and say on their behalf, Mabuhai. On this Easter morning, I testify of the living Christ, that He rose from the dead, and that His love for us and for our Father in heaven is pure and eternal. Today, I desire to focus on the love of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ for all, which is manifest through the atonement of His Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. When the prophet Nephi was asked by an angel about his knowledge of God, Nephi responded simply, I know that he loveth his children. A verse from the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, powerfully describes the Savior's perfect love. And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. They scourge him, they smite him, they spit upon him, and he suffered it because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. The Savior's universal love is the motivating force behind all that He does. We know that it is the same love our Father in Heaven has for us, because the Savior humbly taught that He and the Father are one. How then do we reciprocate and show our gratitude for their universal love? The Savior taught us with this simple, all-encompassing invitation. If you love me, keep my commandments. President Dallin H. Oaks taught, quote, God's universal and perfect love is shown in all the blessings of His gospel plan, including the fact that His choicest blessings are reserved for those who obey His laws." Close quote. 
I would like to share three specific ways our Heavenly Father manifests His love for us, His children. First, relationships with God and family manifest His love. Our most valuable relationships are with the Father and the Son and with our own families because our ties to them are eternal. The great plan of happiness is a wonderful manifestation of God's love for us. With eyes riveted on God's plan, we willingly choose to carve out soil and rocks within us that support selfish desires and replace them with foundations that build eternal relationships. In a sense, this can be called spiritual excavation. In performing our spiritual excavation, we must first seek after God and call upon Him. Seeking after Him and calling upon Him will begin the process and provide space to build and strengthen our eternal relationships. It broadens our spiritual view and helps us focus on changing what we can control rather than on fears outside of control. Studying the life and ministry of our Savior, Jesus Christ, will enable us to view these other concerns with an eternal perspective. Distractions can sometimes prevent us from experiencing God's love in our family relationships and activities. A mother feeling that gadgets were taking over her family relationships came up with a solution. At the dinner table and in other family times, she just calls out, phones on the deck, let us have FaceTime. She says that this is the new norm for their family and that it strengthens their relationship as a family when they have real FaceTime. They now enjoy quality, come follow me discussions together as a family. Second, he manifests his love to his children by calling prophets. Our current world is deluged in a war of words and tumult of opinions. Paul reminds us that there are so many kinds of voices in the world. Which of all the voices rise clearly and meaningfully above the fray? It is the voice of God's prophets, seers, and revelators. I remember vividly after undergoing surgery in 2018. Upon returning to work, I was in the parking garage at church headquarters. Suddenly, I heard the voice of President Russell M. Nelson calling, Taniella, Taniella. I ran towards him, and he asked how I was doing. I said, I am recovering very well, President Nelson. He gave me counsel and a hug. I truly felt the personal ministry of a prophet to the one. President Nelson has traveled to many nations of the earth. In my mind, he is not just ministering to thousands, but he is ministering to thousands of ones. In doing so, he shares the love God has for all his children. Recently, the words of President Nelson have been a source of strength and inspiration to the people of the Philippines. As with every country in the world, during 2020, the Philippines was severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a volcanic eruption, earthquakes, typhoons, and devastating floods. But like a pillar of light shining through dark clouds of fear, loneliness, and despair, came the words of the prophet. It included the call for worldwide fasting and prayer, and counsel to move forward despite the pandemic. He invited us to make our homes personal sanctuaries of faith. He called upon Latter-day Saints everywhere to respect all of God's children and to let God prevail in our lives. Likewise, Turing was President Nelson's recent video testimony about the power of gratitude and his concluding prayer which resonated across the Philippines. The Philippines, along with the entire world, are so blessed to feel God's love through the words of his chosen prophet. Third, chastening can be a manifestation of God's love for his children. Sometimes God manifests his love by chastening us. It is a way of reminding us that he loves us and that he knows who we are. His promised blessings of peace is open to all those who courageously walk the covenant path and are willing to receive correction. When we recognize the chastening and are willing recipients, it becomes a spiritual surgery. Who likes surgery, by the way? But to those who need it and are willing to receive it, it can be life-saving. The Lord chastens whom he loves. The scriptures tell us so. That chastening or spiritual surgery will bring about needed change in our lives. Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration, was chastened. After losing the 116 pages of the Book of Mormon manuscript, the Lord both corrected and showed love by saying, you should not have feared man more than God. You should have been faithful. Behold, thou art Joseph, and thou wast chosen. Remember, God is merciful, therefore repent. In 2016, while serving a mission in Little Rock, Arkansas, I asked Brother Dava to deliver a package to my older sister who lived on an island in Fiji. 
His response was not something that I had anticipated. President Wakolo, he groaned, your sister passed away and was buried 10 days ago. I had self-pity and even felt a little upset that my family did not even bother to let me know. The next day, while my wife was teaching missionaries, this thought penetrated my soul. Daniela, all these experiences are for your own good and development. You have been teaching and sharing your testimony about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now live accordingly. I was reminded that happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, we should despise not the chastening of the Almighty. It was a spiritual surgery for me, and the outcome was immediate. Just as I was contemplating the experience, I was called upon to give my concluding thoughts to this cousin. Among other things, I shared the lessons that I had just been taught. One, I had just been chastened by the Holy Ghost, and I loved it because I was the only one who heard it. Two, because of the Savior's sacrifice and ransom, I will no longer refer to my challenges as trials and tribulations, but as my learning experiences. And three, because of his perfect and sinless life, I will no longer refer to my shortcomings and lack of abilities as weaknesses, but rather as my development opportunities. This experience helped me know that God chastens us because he loves us. I conclude, our eternal Father and his Son Jesus Christ show their love by making it possible for us to have eternal relationships with them and our family members, by calling modern day prophets to teach and minister to us, and by chastening us to help us learn and grow. God be thanked for the matchless gift of his divine son, our resurrected Lord, even the living Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our dear prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, said in our last general conference, during these perilous times of which the Apostle Paul prophesied, Satan is no longer even trying to hide his attack on God's plan. Emboldened evil abounds. Therefore, the only way to survive spiritually is to be determined to let God prevail in our lives, to learn to hear his voice, and to use our energy to help gather Israel. As we consider the prophet's invitation to learn to hear God's voice, are our hearts determined or hardened? Let us remember the counsel given in Jacob, chapter 6, verse 6. Yea, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For why will ye die? Let us be determined to let God prevail in our lives. How can we let God prevail in our lives and not the adversary? In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, verse 34, we read, Therefore fear not, little flock, do good. Let earth and hell combine against you. For if ye are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. It is a significant promise. Although earth and hell may combine against us, they cannot prevail if we choose to not to let God prevail by establishing our lives upon his rock. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus Christ taught of a wise man and a foolish man, recorded in Matthew, chapter 7 of the New Testament. Many of you have heard the primary song, The Wise Man and the Foolish Man. If you have taken the time to compare the four verses in the song, you will find that verses 1 and 2 are very similar to verses 3 and 4. Both the wise man and the foolish man were building a house. 
they want to provide their families with a safe and comfortable home. They desire to live happily together forever as a family, just like you and me. The surrounding situation was the same. The rains came down and the floods came up. We sing it six times when we sing that song. The only difference is that the wise man built his house upon the rock and the house stood still. Whereas the foolish man built his house upon the sand and his house washed away. Therefore, where our foundation is, is really matters. And this has a decisive effect on the outcome ultimately and eternally. I hope and pray that we all will find and stay on the sure foundation as we establish our future life. We are reminded in Helaman chapter 5, verse 12. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless world. Because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. That is the promise from God. If we build our foundation on Jesus Christ, we cannot fall. As we endure faithfully to the end, God will help us establish our lives upon his rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. We may not be able to change all of we, what is coming, but we can choose how we prepare for what is coming. Some of us may think the gospel is good, so we need to put it in our lives. Maybe once a week. Just going to church once a week is not enough to build upon the rock. Our entire life should be filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not part of our lives, but our lives is actually part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Is that not true? Our mortal life is only part of the whole plan of salvation and exaltation. God is our heavenly Father. He loves all of us. He knows our potential way better than we know ourselves. He knows not only the details of our lives. God knows the details of the details of the details of our lives. Please follow our living prophet, President Nelson's wise counsel. As recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 21, verses 5 and 6. For his word ye shall receive as if from my own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and caused the heavens to shake 
for your good and his name's glory. For that reason, they cannot prevail and we cannot fall. I testify to you that Christ will come again a second time as he did the first time. But this time it will be with great glory and majesty. I hope and pray that I will be ready to receive him, whether on this side of the veil or on the other side. As we celebrate in this wonderful Easter season, I hope through the atonement of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, I will be able to go up and meet with my maker and say thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I am grateful to be with you this wonderful Easter morning. When I think of Easter, I love to rehearse in my mind the words spoken by angels to those who were at the garden tomb. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. I testify that Jesus of Nazareth was resurrected, and he lives. Thirty-four years ago, my missionary companion and I met and taught a very intellectual man who was a contributing writer in a local newspaper in Davao City in the Philippines. We enjoyed teaching him because he had a lot of questions and was very respectful of our beliefs. The most memorable question he asked us was, what think ye of Christ? We of course excitedly shared our feelings and bore testimony of Jesus Christ. He later published an article on the same topic that contained wonderful words and phrases about the Savior. I remember being impressed, but not necessarily lifted. It had good information, but felt hollow and lacked spiritual power. What think ye of Christ? I am realizing that how intimately I know the Savior significantly influences my ability to hear him, as well as how I respond. A few years ago, Elder David A. Bednar asked the following questions as part of his remarks. Quote, do we only know about the Savior, or are we increasingly coming to know Him? How do we come to know the Lord?" Close quote. As I studied and pondered, I came to the stark realization that what I know about the Savior greatly outweighed how much I really know Him. I resolved then to put forth more effort to know Him. I am very grateful for the scriptures and testimonies of faithful men and women disciples of Jesus Christ. My own journey over the last few years has taken me down many roads of study and discovery. I pray that the Holy Ghost will convey to you today a message far greater than the inadequate words that I have written. First, we need to recognize that knowing the Savior is the most important pursuit of our lives. It should take priority over anything else. Quote, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Close quote. Second, as we are increasingly coming to know the Savior, scriptural passages and the words of the prophets become so intimately meaningful to us that they become our own words. It is not about copying the words and feelings and experiences of others as much as it is coming to know for ourselves in our own unique way by experimenting upon the word and receiving a witness from the Holy Ghost. As the prophet Alma declared, quote, Do you not suppose that I know of these things of myself? Behold, I testify unto you that I do know that these things whereof I have spoken are true. And how do you suppose that I know of their surety? Behold, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. And now I do know of myself that they are true, for the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me by his Holy Spirit. And this is the spirit of revelation which is in me. Third, an increasing understanding that the atonement of Jesus Christ applies to us personally and individually will help us know Him. 
Oftentimes, it is easier for us to think and speak of Christ's atonement in general terms than to recognize its personal significance in our lives. The atonement of Jesus Christ is infinite and eternal and all-encompassing in its breadth and depth, but wholly personal and individual in its effects. Because of His atoning sacrifice, the Savior has power to cleanse, heal, and strengthen us one by one. The Savior's only desire, His only purpose from the very beginning, was to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father was for Him to assist in bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of men by becoming our advocate with the Father. Hence, quote, Though he were the Son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and to all them that obey him. And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and he will take upon him death, that he may lose the bands of death, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. The Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, that he might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. I would like to share a simple experience that illustrates the struggle we sometimes have to embrace the personal nature of the Lord's Atonement. Years ago, at the invitation of my file leader, I read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover and marked the verses that reference the Lord's Atonement. He also invited me to prepare a one-page summary of what I learned. I said to myself, one page? Sure, that is easy. To my surprise, however, I found the task to be extremely difficult, and I failed. I have since realized I failed because I missed the mark and have incorrect assumptions. First, I expected a summary to be inspiring to everyone. The summary was meant for me and not for anyone else. It was meant to capture my feelings and emotions about the Savior and what He has done for me so that every time I read it, it will bring to the surface wonderful, poignant, and personal spiritual experiences. Second, I expected a summary to be grand and elaborate and contain big words and phrases. It was never about big words. It was meant to be a clear and simple declaration of conviction. Quote, for my soul delighteth in plainness, for after his manner that the Lord God work among the children of men, for the Lord God giveth light unto the understanding. Third, I expected it to be perfect, a summary to end all summaries, a final summary that one cannot and should not add to, instead of a work in progress that I can add a word here or a phrase there as my understanding of Jesus Christ's atonement increases. As a young man, I learned a lot from my conversations with my bishop. During those tender years, I learned to love these words from a favorite hymn. I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me, confused at the grace that so fully he proffers me. I tremble to know that for me he was crucified, that for me, a sinner, he suffered, he bled and died. Oh, it is wonderful that he should care for me enough to die for me. Oh, it is wonderful wonderful to me. The prophet Moroni invited us to, and now I would command you to seek this Jesus of whom the apostles and, apost apostles and prophets have written. President Russell M. Nelson promised that, quote, if we proceed to learn all we can about Jesus Christ, our ability to turn away from sin will increase, our desire to keep the commandments will soar, close quote. On this Easter Sunday, just as the Savior came forth from his stone grave, May we awake from our spiritual slumber and rise above the clouds of doubt, the clutches of fear, the intoxicating pride, and the lull of complacency. Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father live. I testify of their perfect love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 We are grateful to the various choirs for the beautiful music that has been provided this morning. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square will close this meeting by singing 
that great Easter anthem, He is Risen. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Arnulfo Valenzuela, a native of Mexico. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm grateful for the privilege of speaking with you on this Easter Sunday. The atoning sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ changed each of our lives forever. We love Him and gratefully worship Him and our Heavenly Father. During the past six months, we have continued to grapple with a global pandemic. I marvel at your resilience and spiritual strength in the face of illness, loss, and isolation. I pray constantly that through it all, you will feel the Lord's unfailing love for you. If you have responded to your trials with a stronger discipleship, this past year will not have been in vain. This morning, we have heard from church leaders who come from every populated continent on earth. Truly, the blessings of the gospel are for every race, language, and people. The Church of Jesus Christ is a global church. Jesus Christ is our leader. Thankfully, even the pandemic has not been able to slow the onward march of his truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ is exactly what is needed in this confused, contentious, and weary world. Each of God's children deserves the opportunity to hear and accept the healing, redeeming message of Jesus Christ. No other message is more vital to our happiness now and forever. No other message is more filled with hope. No other message can eliminate contention in our society. Faith in Jesus Christ is the foundation of all belief and the conduit of divine power. According to the Apostle Paul, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Everything good in life, every potential blessing of eternal significance begins with faith. Allowing God to prevail in our lives begins with faith that He is willing to guide us. True repentance begins with faith that Jesus Christ has the power to cleanse, heal, and strengthen us. Deny not the power of God, the prophet Moroni declared, for He worketh by power according to the faith of the children of men. It is our faith that unlocks the power of God in our lives. And yet, exercising faith can seem overwhelming. At times, we may wonder if we can possibly muster enough faith to receive the blessings that we so desperately need. However, the Lord put those fears to rest through the words of the Book of Mormon prophet Alma. Alma asks us simply to experiment upon the word and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if we can no more than desire to believe. The phrase particle of faith reminds me of the Lord's biblical promise that if we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, we shall be able to say unto this mountain, 
Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. The Lord understands our mortal weakness. We all falter at times, but he also knows of our great potential. The mustard seed starts small, but grows into a tree large enough for birds to nest in its branches. The mustard seed represents a small, but growing faith. The Lord does not require perfect faith for us to have access to his perfect power, but he does ask us to believe. My dear brothers and sisters, my call to you this Easter morning is to start today to increase your faith. Through your faith, Jesus Christ will increase your ability to move the mountains in your life. Even though your personal challenges may loom as large as Mount Everest, your mountains may be loneliness, doubt, illness, or other personal problems. Your mountains will vary. And yet the answer to each of your challenges is to increase your faith. That takes work. Lazy learners and lax disciples will always struggle to muster even a particle of faith. To do anything well requires effort. Becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no exception. Increasing your faith and trust in him takes effort. May I offer five suggestions to help you develop that faith and trust? First, study. Become an engaged learner. Immerse yourself in the scriptures to understand better Christ's mission and ministry. Know the doctrine of Christ so that you understand its power for your life. Internalize the truth that the atonement of Jesus Christ applies to you. He took upon himself your misery, your mistakes, your weakness, and your sins. He paid the compensatory price and provided the power for you to move every mountain you will ever face. You obtain that power with your faith, trust, and willingness to follow him. Moving your mountains may require a miracle. Learn about miracles. Miracles come according to your faith in the Lord. Central to that faith is trusting his will and timetable how and when he will bless you with the miraculous help you desire. Only your unbelief will keep God from blessing you with miracles to move the mountains in your life. The more you learn about the Savior, the easier it will be to trust in his mercy, his infinite love, and his strengthening, healing, and redeeming power. The Savior is never closer to you than when you are facing or climbing a mountain with faith. Second, choose to believe in Jesus Christ. If you have doubts about God the Father and his beloved Son, or the validity of the restoration or the veracity of Joseph Smith's divine calling as a prophet. Choose to believe and stay faithful. Take your questions to the Lord and to other faithful sources. Study with the desire to believe rather than with the hope that you can find a flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life or a discrepancy in the scriptures. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. 
allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. Third, act in faith. What would you do if you had more faith? Think about it. Write about it. Then receive more faith by doing something that requires more faith. Fourth, partake of sacred ordinances worthily. Ordinances unlock the power of God for your life. And fifth, ask your Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ for help. Faith takes work. Receiving revelation takes work. But everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. God knows what will help your faith grow. Ask, and then ask again. A non-believer might say that faith is for the weak, but this assertion overlooks the power of faith. Would the Savior's apostles have continued to teach his doctrine after his death at the peril of their lives if they had doubted him? Would Joseph and Hiram Smith have suffered martyrs' deaths defending the restoration of the Lord's church unless they had a sure witness that it was true? Would nearly 2,000 saints have died along the Pioneer Trail if they did not have faith that the gospel of Jesus Christ had been restored? Truly, faith is the power that enables the unlikely to accomplish the impossible. Do not minimize the faith you already have. It takes faith to join the church and remain faithful. It takes faith to follow prophets rather than pundits and popular opinion. It takes faith to serve a mission during a pandemic. It takes faith to live a chaste life when the world shouts that God's law of chastity is now outmoded. It takes faith to teach the gospel to children in a secular world. It takes faith to plead for the life of a loved one, and even more faith to accept a disappointing answer. Two years ago, Sister Nelson and I visited Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and Tahiti. Each of those island nations had experienced heavy rains for days. Members had fasted and prayed that their outdoor meetings would be protected from the rain. In Samoa, Fiji, and Tahiti, just as the meetings began, the rain stopped. But in Tonga, the rain did not stop. Yet, 13,000 faithful saints came hours early to get a seat, waited patiently through a steady downpour, and then sat through a very wet two-hour meeting. We saw vibrant faith at work in each of those, among each of those islanders, faith sufficient to stop the rain and faith to persevere when the rain did not stop. The mountains in our lives do not always move how or when we would like, but our faith will always propel us forward. Faith always increases our access to godly power. Please know this. If everything and everyone else in the world in whom you trust should fail, Jesus Christ and his church will never fail you. The Lord never slumbers, nor does he sleep. 
He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will not forsake his covenants, his promises, or his love for his people. He works miracles today, and he will work miracles tomorrow. Faith in Jesus Christ is the greatest power available to us in this life. All things are possible to them that believe. Your growing faith in him will move mountains, not the mountains of rock that beautify the earth, but the mountains of misery in your lives. Your flourishing faith will help you turn challenges into unparalleled growth and opportunity. On this Easter Sunday, with my deep feelings of love and gratitude, I declare my witness that Jesus Christ is indeed risen. He is risen to lead his church. He is risen to bless the lives of all of God's children, wherever they live. With faith in him, we can move the mountains in our lives. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Our dear Father in heaven, at the conclusion of this wonderful session of conference, on this Easter Sunday, when we celebrate thy Son, Jesus Christ's victory over sin and death, which will guide us 
to the and to uh, hope of eternal future joy. We come to thee and bow our heads and and pray and express gratitude for thy blessings, for thy Son, Jesus Christ, his atonement and resurrection. We are grateful, Father, for thy church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are grateful for our living prophets, seers, and revelators. We are grateful for the teachings that we have received today. We pray that we may follow the advice and counsel of our beloved prophet to increase our faith in thy Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for the First Presidency of Thy Church, for the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Please bless them with health, strength, and revelation to guide us in the covenant path that will bring us back to Thee one day. We pray, Father, this day, and we say, that we love thee, we love thy Son, Jesus Christ, in the sacred name of him who is thy beloved, our Savior and Redeemer, even Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <coughs> This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session was provided by previous recordings of various choirs throughout the world. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.